All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name's Dave Everett, and this is my wife, Sherry. We're going to be continuing our Bible study tonight on Effortless Change by Andrew Womack. Where we're in Chapter 1 tonight. Uh, we did our introduction last week, and we got started on Chapter 1. We're going to read, read one section, and then we're going to go forward from there. Uh, just so you know, all of our Bible studies will be recorded on our website. Uh, we have our last week's on there on LighthouseDiscipleship.org is our website, as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. All of our Sunday morning messages are on both platforms, as well as all of our recordings <coughs> for our Bible studies. So anyway, uh, you can also support our ministry on our website, LighthouseDiscipleship.org, and we thank you for doing so. Um, so we can bring these messages uh, to you, and even worldwide, as some of these do uh, go to other nations. Anyway, uh, so like I said, we're in effortless change tonight. We're in chapter 1. Chapter 1 is titled, It Begins on the Inside. And we're going to be under the first section heading, What Have You Planted? We read that last week, but we're going to read it again, and then we'll go from there. So Sherry will be our reader. She'll narrate for us, and then we'll talk about it. So... Once we get all dialed in here, we'll get all started. Um, <coughs> we good? Okay, we're good. All right. All right. Oops, wrong page. What have you planted? People typically respond to tough circumstances and situations by blaming someone or something else. It's the color of my skin. It's my family background. I was disadvantaged. They'll blame anybody. This person mistreated me. It's my employer who's the jerk, not me. It's always somebody else's fault. However, the word makes it clear that your experience, your surroundings, everything about you is basically a result of the way you think. As you think in your heart, that's the way it is. When you think spiritually minded thoughts, you get life and peace. When you don't, you get death, Romans 8, 6. You may not like that. You might be saying, no, that's not true, but it is. If I came over to your house to see your garden, I wouldn't have had to be with you in the beginning when you sowed the seeds to know what you've planted. All I have to do is observe the plants that are growing up. If you have corn growing there, you planted corn. If there are peas, you sowed peas. You may claim that someone else came in and planted something in the garden you did not attend. However, ultimately, it's your responsibility to guard and protect your garden. Whatever is growing there is what you've planted or what you've allowed to be planted there. Just as this is true in the natural realm, it's true in the spiritual realm. Whatever is growing in the garden of your life is what you've planted or allowed to be planted in your heart. Before you can really see change, you must quit using excuses and blaming anybody and everybody else for what is wrong in your life. You have to start saying, you have to stop saying, it's just fate or bad luck or nothing ever works for me. Scripture reveals that as you think in your heart, that's the way you're going to be. Proverbs 23, 7. If you think spiritually minded, your thoughts will produce life and peace. Romans 8, 6. All right, so again, we're talking about effortless change. We started to start a new book. We started last week. We're still in chapter one here, and we're talking about specifically, it begins on the inside, and, and the title of this section that we just read is, What Have You Planted? You know, if I, uh, you, like Andrew said, you don't have to see someone plant their, their garden or plant their, their crop to know what they planted. You can, you can tell, after a while, you can tell what's growing. You know, here in Camarillo, we have a lot of farmland nearby, and we can we can we'll take drives periodically, and uh, you can kind of see what people are planting, they are growing. How do you know? I wasn't there when they planted everything, but I can sure see the evidence of what they're planting. Or smell the evidence. We passed strawberry fields months ago, and we weren't seeing the strawberries, but we smelled strawberries, and we had the windows down, and it smelled divine, and. It's, lo and behold, there were strawberry fields. So you know, uh, based on that illustration, you know, you uh, if you you know if you don't like corn, well, don't plant corn. What are you planting in your mind? You know, 
our mind is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is like soil. What are you putting in there? Are you putting the word of God in your mind? Are you putting Facebook on your mind all day? Are you listening to teaching and other people teach? Is it good teaching, bad teaching? Are you listening to the world and, uh, you know, family, friends, even enemies, you know? And I know sometimes we don't always have control of everything. Just like a, a gardener or a farmer doesn't always have control of everything that comes in his field. You know, there's birds, there's bees, uh, you know, weeds can come. But he's got, he's got a, he's got a plan for that. And he's got to sometimes weed his garden. And, uh, and so I don't know exactly how all the farmers do that. I'm not a gardener, I'm not a farmer. But at the same point in time, you know, I, we do have grass, and once in a while, I will do some weed and feed out there. I will sometimes have to get the weeds. I, can, I can't always control what comes into my garden, but I can control what's going to stay. Um, I can say, this is not going to stay. I'm not going to have this in my yard. I'm not going to have those weeds in my yard. You know, and so there's, 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 a, there's a constant work effort to, to, to do that. You know, what are we allowing in our mind? You know, Wigglesworth wouldn't even allow a newspaper in his house. <laughs> I don't think he would allow Facebook or a lot of things that we allow nowadays. We don't have a TV. We watch a lot of movies, but uh, we choose what we, what we watch. Uh, you know, I haven't seen a commercial in years. Today's Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm not missing it. <laughs> you know, I'm doing just fine without it. I'm not anti-football in itself, but uh, it's become so political now that I, that I have my own thoughts about that but at the same point in time uh, <coughs> you know we we can guard what we're going to listen to sometimes sometimes in some of our environments where we live or where we work uh, we don't always have control of everything we do i've worked at some jobs where there was cussing going around all the times and it seemed like locker room talk sometimes i couldn't always control that it, i'm it wasn't my house it wasn't my business i can't control all of that you know, so I have to sometimes de detox at the end of the, uh, another word, de uh, detox at the end of the day and just kind of, you know, sometimes we have to just detox, uh, from the world that we live in and, uh, just get some of that stuff out of our system. In other words, we need to make, get a place where this is the most dominant seed in our mind. You can have other seeds and you might not always be able to control everything. But you can let this be the most dominant thing. You can even go, but I used to work re a lot of retail and I can, I can have his word in my mind all day long as I'm stocking shelves and whatnot. Yeah, there was constant interruptions with customer service and whatnot. And that's why I'm there. That was my job. But at the same point in time, I can, my mind can be so stayed upon him that I, I can choose. And I know that's not the perfect route, route you know. Um, sometimes we're busy and we don't always have the quality time. We actually went out this afternoon, did a little bit of frisbee golf and enjoyed outdoors and, uh, uh, we could tell we're out of shape. But at the same point in time, you know, we just got out there and did some things and had some quality time to there. We don't always get that. We, the weekend is our time to, in between busy weeks, to, to kind of do some of that. Yesterday we went on a long hike for five miles. I'm worn out after that. But at the same point in time, you know, it just, uh, it was nice to be able to get together and, and just, uh, smell that all nice, fresh California sea breeze air. And so, uh, anyway, it just, uh, um, kind of, I'm kind of getting off track here a little bit, but you know, what are you allowing in your mind? What are you planting? You know, some things need to be weeded out and some things need to be planted. And, uh, and, and so we, what are you planting? What thoughts are you mowing over in your mind? Are they good thoughts? Are they negative thoughts? Are you worrying about stuff? You know, uh, um, there's a lot of things going on in our world today. Are you worried about this? Jesus says many hearts will wax cold because of the things coming on the earth. I don't want my heart to wax cold because of, uh, of faith and fear because of things that are coming on the earth. Jesus, Paul, John, James, all the apostles uh, prophesied that these things would happen in these last days. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to keep our focus on him. Things are going to get tough and things are going to get dark. Uh, you know, uh, but... Uh, we know we know how the story ends. We know how the book ends. We know we win at the end. Keep your focus on him. I'm not saying be so. We also I don't think we should be so out of touch that we're not involved in our world and we're not involved in politics to a certain degree. We need to be involved. I think a lot of what's going on today is because the church has been too passive in some ways. At the same point in time, uh, you know. Uh, <coughs> I need to keep my eyes, my, for my own sanity, focus on the Lord. And so, um, 
You know, we have to choose that, and we have to, to balance that. And, you know, Jesus ministered a lot, but he had to sometimes shoo the people away so he could spend time with the Father. It's not that he didn't want to be with the people, but he knew that if he's going to continue to minister to people, he's going to have to spend some time with the Father. And uh, otherwise, he's going to, going to run out, because uh, Jesus was the Son. Yes, he's the Son of God, but he put all that aside to become the Son of Man. And he was dependent on the Father, just like you and I are dependent on the Father. We need to spend time with God. And sometimes we have to say no to something so we can spend time with the Lord. You know, we've had a few friends through the years, and a couple in particular, where they just prioritized their time with God. And sometimes they had to say no to us to hang out. I honored that. I thought that was awesome. And I, I missed their company, you know, and uh, I, I wish... Uh, their time of God was a different time than my time clock, but uh, but I still I still uh, marveled at that and esteemed that, and I never looked down at that. So it you know sometimes we just need to say no to something. You know, there's times I say no to other people so I can spend time with my wife, and then sometimes I'm like, hey, everyone's invited. <laughs> you know, there's we just have to. We have to kind of guard what we can do and what we can't do. And so, uh, anyway, we, but we, our mind, our mind, you know, we're going to get into the parable of the seller eventually in this book. Uh, but, you know, Mark and Luke, they, uh, when Jesus, after the parable of the seller, I forget who said what, but Mark and Luke recorded the words of Jesus. And one of them said, take heed what you hear. And the other one says, take heed how you hear. What you are listening to and how you are listening. How do you know you can listen to the right thing but with a critical attitude? You can listen to the right stuff but your mind is critical. You know, when I was first introduced to Andrew Womack, the guy who introduced me to Andrew Womack, he was a bad teacher. Uh, uh, he, he just thought was off. And so when I picked up Andrew's book that he gave me, I thought he was just going to be just like this other guy who, who introduced me. But it wasn't. And I, I realized Andrew's preaching the truth. I closed the book and started over with a better attitude and so I could receive. You know, when you have a critical attitude, it doesn't matter who's teaching you, uh, you're not going to receive. Or you're going to, you're, you're going to, you have a totally different lens on, you're not going to listen. We need to take heed what we listen to and we need to take heed how we listen to it. If that seed, God's word is going to take root in our lives the way it should. And so what are you listening to? What are you planting? What are you planting in your minds? Uh, you know, how, what's going on in the garden of your mind? Uh, that, that's important. Because uh, uh, I think it's Proverbs, uh, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. We need to guard our heart. We need to guard that thing, you know, uh, 24-7. You know, we have to guard our heart. Because our heart is, Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah uh, 17, verse 10. It's, it's deceitful. <laughs> it's wicked. <laughs> And so we need to guard our heart above all things. You know, a, a while ago, um, and, and this is a, a story uh, from my own life and experience. You know, Dave and I at times refer to some stuff that's happened to us that uh, has really hurt our hearts um, and at times broken our hearts. And I caught myself... Uh, planting seeds of bitterness and offense in my own heart <coughs> and I was seeing the destruction of that in my own life I was seeing other people who lived in offense and bitterness and you know the, some stuff that has happened to, to us or others you know in in the natural it's easy to say well you deserve to be offended at so-and-so or to be bitter at them for what they've done but I, I realized the, um, the bad that it was doing to my own heart and life and health and other people's. And when I realized that, I, I really took a stand and I prayed. And I, it was really the Holy Spirit who helped me. And I, I don't know what I would have done if I didn't have the Holy Spirit to lean on uh, to be my teacher and comforter. Uh, but he helped me and he taught me to not allow bitterness and anger and offense to take hold and, and take root in my heart. I'm not saying it was easy for me, but I realized the health benefits both in my soul and physically in my heart as well 
how devastating that is. And when you take John 15 about abiding in the vine, you know, Jesus himself talks about abiding in him and he and us, and we will bear much fruit. And if you, and if you take that and you've listened to, you know, Dave refers to a message he did a while ago, and I wish I could have that uh, sermon right at the tip of my tongue to tell you which one to listen to. But how Dave preached it and how my own walk with the Lord has has uh, brought me down this, this certain path of not dwelling in, in bitterness and offense and letting that take root in my heart. You know, I, I, really, I really just took a stand and I wanted to bear the fruit of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit and not let bitterness destroy my life. And... You know, if you take John 15, but then you also read Galatians 5, 22 and 23, where it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. That's part of the fruit that Jesus is talking about. And when I took that stand and the Holy Spirit helped me, I wanted the fruit of the spirit to come out and bear fruit in me not the bitterness because the bitterness and offense has ugly demonic fruit and J D dave's message um you know he he said something that really resounded with me because he said if you don't want carrots don't plant carrots if you don't want corn don't plant corn but he brought it into, if you don't want strife, don't plant strife. If you don't want evil or, or chaos or whatever, don't plant that. If you want peace, plant peace. And, you know, you just you just take what Jesus said, what, what Paul says, you know, what Dave said about be careful what you're planting in your heart, you know, what Andrew's, you know, coming across. You know, there is a big difference and a big difference. Uh, I just can't say enough, you know, to be careful about what you plant. And I'm glad Andrew went here. And, you know, when Dave was talking, I actually thought of of um, of Ashley and Carly Terrades. You know, they're, they're ministers. They, uh, they came from England, but they live in the States now. And, you know, their testimony, they, they, they have uh, quite a bit, um, but the testimony I'm thinking of is both Carly and their daughter, Hannah. Hannah, had health issues. And yet, Carly and Ashley planted the Word of God in their hearts, and they weren't going to garden anything else. They took hold of those seeds, and they nourished those seeds, and then let God's Word nourish and water those seeds, and they just abided in Jesus. And the testimony is both Carly and, and Hannah were healed of some horrendous, horrible health issues. And, you know, their daughter was basically, I think she was two, was basically given the death sentence. This isn't going to get, she's just going to die. And yet they, they took a stand and they planted God's word in their heart. And... Uh, they had a lot of arrows from the enemy try to take that seed from them, uh, but they took a stand and they 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 gardened their heart well, and um, they're living testimonies of of uh, abiding in Jesus. Right. Well, let's read a little bit more. It's uh, the next section is called the knowledge of God, and we've talked a lot about this in, in times past. But let's go ahead and read it. Second Peter one. Uh, verse 2 further substantiates the principle that your, lo your thought life produces a harvest in the natural realm when it says grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Many people want grace and peace to be multiplied to them. They desire peace in their life and they're praying for it. They may even be asking other people to help them get it. Actually, they're looking for peace to come externally from outside them into their circumstances. These words in Second Peter 1 verse 2 reveal that peace comes through the knowledge of God. 
Peace in your life isn't the absence of problems or challenging circumstances around you. God's kind of peace is there, is there even in the midst of a storm. It resides on the inside. Then eventually that peace on the inside of you will begin to change your circumstances on the outside. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. 2 Peter 1, three. This verse says that God's divine power has, past tense, already given to us all things. Most people want God to just come with his power from the outside in. They pray, oh Lord, stretch forth your mighty hand and touch me. They're looking for God to send a spiritual bolt of lightning to hit them. And then boom, they're healed, prospered, delivered, or whatever they need. However, this scripture says that all things that pertain to life and godliness come through the knowledge of God. This includes healing, prosperity, deliverance, joy, peace, success in business, good relationships, and anything else. Everything that pertains to life and godliness comes through the knowledge of God. This means that the born-again Christian already has the peace of God in their spirit. As they renew their mind to who they are and what they have in Christ, they draw that peace out into their experience. The dominant experience of your life is a reflection of the way you are thinking on the inside. Proverbs 23, 7. Instead of looking for a change to take place externally in everybody and everything else around you, the first thing you need to do is recognize that change begins on the inside of you. This occurs according to the knowledge that you have of God. 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3. Um, I'm liking this chapter more and more, and uh, we talked a lot of, along these lines in the past, but I uh, just, uh, you know, this verse keeps reoccurring to Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh, so is he. You know, what's your most dominant thought? You know, <clears throat> the Bible says in First Peter 1, 23, that we are born again of incorruptible, incorruptible seed. Everything starts from a seed. If you plant an apple tree, it started with a seed. And that seed is everything that apple tree needs. The roots, the, the, the branches, the sap, the blossoms, the seeds, the ap more apples. Everything that, that that tree needs, the leaves, is in that seed already. God has already commanded every seed to produce after its own kind. He commanded that in Genesis 1.11. We're born again. We have the seed of God on the inside of us. The word of God is also called a seed. And everything we need for life and godliness, according to the verse here in Second Peter, is, is, is in the knowledge of God. Everything you need for life, everything you need for godliness, is found in the knowledge of God. Grace and peace is multiplied to you. In the knowledge of God. You, in other words, taking this context of our mind being the, 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 the sowing ground. You need to fertilize your mind with the word and the knowledge of God. If you're going to change. If you're going to see change in your life. It's going to come from the inside out. I always compare a, a, a Christmas tree with a fruit tree. I love Christmas trees. But in this context, I'll, I'll take it into a negative context. A Christmas tree, when you decorate it for Christmas, you usually put things that are not of nature on it. I've seen many beautiful Christmas trees. They have light bulbs on it. They have uh, bulbs on it. They have, uh, some people put popcorn or garland on it. Some people put all kind of ornaments and decorations on that tree. But none of those decorations and lights and the beautiful things that we see at a Christmas tree are as nature. <laughs> You, I, I, I've never seen an evergreen tree in the forest grow lights, or grow bulbs, or grow popcorn. You know, they might, uh, we usually put some pine cones and some uh, um, uh, birds on there, cardinals and, and blue jays and whatnot. Those are a little no more natural. Of course, a tree doesn't grow a bird, uh, you know. But at the same point in time, you know, you, my point is you, 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 ad, you ad, adorn it with things that are not its nature. 
But a fruit tree, an apple tree in particular, grows fruit from within. It grows it naturally. And I want the nature of God. I want the godliness of God. I want the life of God in my life to produce from the inside out. How am I going to get, how is that going to happen? I'm already born, if I'm in Christ, I'm already born of his seed. But I need to water that seed with the word of God. It's in the knowledge of God that I, that I have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Everything you need, your, your healing, your provision, your wisdom, everything you're praying to God for is already found in the seed of God's word. It's already in the seed. It's already in your born again nature. But you need to, in the knowledge of God, you, you will receive everything that pertains to life and godliness. Life changes the supernatural can happen from the inside out. We're looking for it from there. We're looking for God to do it out there. We're looking for God to do this and that. You already have it. You already have, It's already in the inside. It's already in that seed of God's word. And we, how do we draw it out? How do we, how do we see it come to fruition? How does the seed gestate and germinate and produce after its own kind? It needs to be watered. It needs some sunshine. Not S-O, not S-U-N, S-O-N. It needs some sunshine on it. It needs some, it needs, uh, it needs some water, the water of God's word. It needs a proper balance. You know, some seeds you can't water it too much, and some seeds you can't give it too much sunshine or direct sun. Every seed, <coughs> every seed is a little different, you know. And I'm not saying we can have too much of Jesus or too much of his word, but you also need to digest it. You know, some people are just cramming it down their throats and they don't understand everything they're saying. You know, the parable of the sower, all four kinds of soil heard the word of God, but only one soil understood what they heard. You know, I've had people, we've had many people through the years that they're trying to read a chapter a day or several chapters a day so they get the, the Bible in a year. And I'm all for reading the Bible in a year. But if you don't understand what you're reading because you're, 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 you're reading it so fast, and you don't understand what you're reading, it's not fruitful. I would, I would rather take one verse, or even half a verse, one thought, one phrase, one word, and chew on that all day, versus reading a whole chapter and not understanding anything I read. You know, the Ethiopian unit, with Philip ministered in Acts chapter 8, it wasn't going to do him any good. He, he was, re was reading from Isaiah, he was doing the right thing, reading the Word of God, but until Philip could explain it to him, he wasn't going to understand it. But when he understood it, he got saved. He got born again and baptized at that, that very hour. You know, sometimes we need someone, to, like a pastor, a preacher, to, to take this nice, juicy steak and cut it up in bite-sized pieces so we can understand it and we can chew it. And like a cow chews its cud, we can understand it. It's all in the knowledge of God, but we need to spend time with God. And we've got to spend time in God's Word so we can understand it. Now, until you understand it, it's not going to be fruitful. It just won't. You can hear the God's Word, and that is good. All four kinds of soil heard the Word. You need to hear. You can't understand something you don't hear. So you need to, you need to hear it. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. But you need to understand it. It's in the knowledge of God. You know, the Bible says that uh, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then people come back and say the truth sets people free. No, it doesn't. The, the, only the truth you know will set you free. If you don't know the truth, the truth, although it has the power to set you free, can't set you free because you don't know it. You know, a seed, doesn't, it, can produce, uh, it can produce whatever it's supposed to, whatever kind of seed it is. If it's an apple seed, it can produce apples and apple trees. You could actually have a whole apple orchard if you did it right and uh, through that seed. You might take a little while because you're going to need to get an, another apple tree to get more apples so you can have more seeds. But in time, you could have a whole orchard of apples in time. But that seed is never going to do anything until it's planted in the ground. You know, we had some flower seeds. We had them for a long time sitting in, on the shelf in the garage. And we actually moved them from a couple houses, from one house to another house, you know. But those, those seeds were not going to do one thing until they got planted in that ground. And once they got planted in the ground, they were able to produce a nice, beautiful flower garden. 
You know, uh, God's word is awesome, but you got to know it. You got to study. You got to digest it. You got to chew on it. And more importantly, he, and w- w- you need to understand it. You need to know God's word, and when you know it, you you have everything that pertains to life and godliness in the knowledge of Him. And and, and as you think on these things, you are as a man thinketh, so is he. You know, I want my thoughts to be dominated by the Word of God. I understand what's going on in the world. I understand sometimes what my bodies tell me. I understand what my pocketbooks tell me. I understand what the worlds tell me. Sometimes I even stand on what the churches tell me. But I want to know what God says about the situation. You know, David comes on the scene of Goliath. And this Goliath, this uncircumcised Philistine, who's been taunting the armies of Israel for 40 days. David comes on the scene. He hears what the people are saying, you know, throughout the camp. His own brother Eliab says some things and whatnot. He heard, he heard, um, Goliath himself taunt the, the Israel, armies of Israel. But David said, but I know what my God says about this situation. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? And he wanted to know what God said about the situation. Who cares what this, I don't care how big this giant is. I don't care if all the armies of Israel say different. I know what my God says about the situation. And so, and we, we need to know the knowledge of God about the situation. And, and uh, you know, I, you know, there's been people who come to us with their prayer requests. And, I, I you know, their, 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 their situation is just horrible, what they're going through. The physical stuff they might be going through or whatever. And at some point, I got to cut them off and said, okay, that's enough of the story. Let's say what God has to say about this. And I'm not trying to be insuff- ins- not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude and not wanting to care about the situation. But now it's time to change the music. Now it's time to sing a new song. Now, now it's time to magnify God and say what God has to say about this, this mountain, about the situation. And, and I'm not going to be controlled by my circumstances my my God is going to control my circumstances, and I'm going to let my I'm not going to tell my I'm not going to allow my circumstances to tell me what's going to do. I'm going to uh, allow my God to tell these circumstances where they can go. You know, uh, sometimes we get some things, and we have to tell our bodies, "Pain, you go in the name of Jesus." You know, it might be a real uh, situation, but my God is more real. Than that situation. And that situation has to line up and bow to the name of Jesus. How do I know that? Because of the knowledge of God. The word of God says, by his stripes I am healed. The word of God tells me that my God shall supply all my needs according to his his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I know that my God says he will give me wisdom when I need wisdom. He'll give me knowledge when I need knowledge. Uh, You know, God, my God will lead me by his spirit. And how do I know all this? By the word of God. And I'm going to let the word of God. He is my Lord. He's my Savior, yes. But He is also my Lord. My body is not my Lord. My finances is not my Lord. My emotions is not my Lord. The government is not my Lord. These situations and and stuff is not my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. And I'm going to have all these other things bow to the Lordship of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to bow to him. I'm going to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But it starts with submitting to God. How can I submit to God if I don't even know what he says? You can't submit to something that you don't know what it says. You know, you know it, it, it says in, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, wives submit to yourself to your husbands. It doesn't say husbands make your wife submissive. The submission is on the wife's part, not the husband's. Submission is a voluntary part. You can make someone be compliant, but you can't make someone be submissive. Submissive is a choice on the person. Uh, you can, you know, there's a difference between being compliant and being submissive. Two different things. And so, I, I, God says that by His stripes I'm healed. I'm going to submit to God's word that I am going to be healed. I am not going to be sick. I submit to God's word. I resi- and based on that submission, I resist the devil and he flees. How do I know all that? That's what the word God tells me to do. Submit to God. Some, 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 a lot of us are resisting the devil, but we're not submitting to God. We're not standing on God's word that says I can be healed. 
We're not standing on God's word that I can be blessed. We're resisting the devil, and that's only part of the verse. That's only part of the equation. But you're standing on your own strength. No, we stand on his strength. We stand on his words. We submit to his word. In the knowledge of him, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. We submit to what God says, who God is, and who we are in him. And based on that position, on that <coughs> on that sonship that we have, that we're a child of God. And based on that position, as he being our Lord, we tell our situation, bow to the name of Jesus. And, and uh, anyway, you want to add some things? No, that's good. You don't have anything? Nothing? No, okay. Good. All right. Well, let's read some more then. Reality. This is a simple truth we are discovering, but it's profound. In fact, most people miss it because it's so simple, thinking, no, it must be more complex than that. My present reality can't just be the result of not thinking properly about things. God's word is true. You can turn any circumstance in your life around by getting God's perspective and starting to think his thoughts. Some people call this by different names, but I believe this is what the Bible calls faith. Faith is simply seeing things from God's perspective. When someone does something to you, instead of just reacting in the natural physical realm based on your emotions, faith considers, what does God's word say? So you take scripture like Ephesians 6.12, which says that you aren't wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Instead of just focusing on the fact that a person has pushed your hot button because of God's knowledge that you have through his word, you recognize that the devil can speak through people and use them to come against you. Instead of just seeing things in the natural, you have a different perspective because of the knowledge of God. You think differently on the inside. You realize that your struggle is not really with the person who is angry with you, at you, but with the one who is resisting God who is inside you. Because of this, you are able to respond differently to these situations than other people do. You turn around and love those people who are against you instead of getting into strife, and it produces different results. All of this begins with you thinking differently. I could give you hundreds of testimonies from my life and the lives of others who have personally experienced this truth. This is reality. The world is full of people who want change in their circumstances, but recognize that the change begins on the inside of them. You know, I like this uh, first uh, paragraph that we read in this section uh, where it says, you know, this is a simple truth we are discovering, but it's profound. In fact, most people miss it because it's so simple, thinking, no, it must be more complex than that. My present reality can't just be the result of not thinking properly about God's word. It's true. You can turn any circumstance in your life around by getting God's perspective and starting to think his thoughts. Some people call this by different names, but I believe this is what the Bible calls faith. You know, where does faith come from? The word of God. I want to, no matter what the situation is, in my life, someone else's life, the situation, I want to get God's perspective. Because how many of you know God's perspective is the real perspective? I can be wrong, I can be religious, I can be off, I can call it whatever I want to call it. But God's perspective is the real thing. I want to see things the way God sees it. I want to call things the way God sees it. Some things people we call politically correct, the Bible calls sin. <laughs> you know, uh, there's some things that are just wrong. But at the same point in time, there's some, you know, I want to see God's perspective about things. I know, he's my healer. He's my provider. He's my God. He's my Lord. He's my master. He's my everything. He's my all in all. And there is nothing that my God cannot do. I don't care how complex it is. My God can do the impossible. He specializes in the impossible. And I need to see and get my mind wrapped around his perception about things. This other verse keeps popping around all over the place too from uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 6. 
That to be naturally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I need to see life from a spiritual perspective, not a natural perspective. Natural perspective is death. It doesn't just lead to death. It is death, according to Paul, Romans 8, 6. I need to see life from God's perspective. Again, David and Goliath, the armies of Israel, King Saul, saw things from a natural perspective. David saw it from God's perspective. He saw that they had, he saw the covenant relationship they had with God, he had with God, and this uncircumcised Philistine was no different than the lion and the bear that was trying to steal his sheep, his father's sheep. And so, he, he, he just treated like one of these sheep, you know, and I don't know about you, but I never fought a lion and the bear. In some ways, I would have rather feed, feed a Goliath than a lion and the bear. That's just me, you know, but at the same point in time, I don't want to fight either one of them from a natural perspective. But you know, in David's eyes, the, the giant and the lion and the bear were no different. Why? Because he knew his God. He saw things from God's perspective, and we need to, to get out. We need to get out of the mud and get our eyes planted on the on the rock of God's word and see life from His perspective about the situation. I know sometimes, especially in the longevity of a, a circumstance we might have been going through, a challenge. You know, we we always see of the natural. We need to get out of the natural and see it from God's perspective. All this junk that's going on in our country right now, uh, you know, uh, I need to see it from God's perspective. My God sits on the throne. He is my king. He is my Lord. I pledge allegiance to my God and my country in that order. And my God is my king. And I pledge my allegiance to him. And I worship him and I serve him and him alone. And so... I have to see it from his perspective. You know, God, God's reality is the more, is more real. It's the reality. This flesh is not reality. It's just not. Some people get offended by that, but it's not. It's temporal. It's temporal. But the spiritual is the real. The spiritual created the natural. The spiritual is more real than the, 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 the this flesh and the temporarily. And the, and the Bible says that the, the, the struggles that we go through, they're, they're temporarily. And, you know, but we can change our circumstances. We have story after story after story after story in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about God changing the situation. Jesus, just like at the ministry of Jesus. They were in a storm. There was multiple storms. Jesus calmed the storm and the waves. There was times he fed the mul- twice he fed the multitudes with the boys' lunch. You know, uh, there was no situation that Jesus could not turn it around because of God's word. And Jesus said we can do the things that He did and even more because we have the Holy Spirit. And so we can change our circumstances around. Stop living from a from a, a limited natural perspective. Start getting God's perspective about every situation because that is reality. People might look at you weird, but I look at them weird. You know, and I'm not trying to be mean or rude or whatever. And this is not a power struggle. I don't care in one sense what you believe. I'm going to believe God. Me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. I want you to believe. I want you to, but you know, I can't, you know, um, uh, I, I, I forget who I got this from, but I, I can ex- teach it to you, but I can't make you understand it. And I'm trying to. I want to, you to understand what I'm trying to say, But and I, I'm teaching myself as I'm teaching this. But we need to see life from a God perspective, a spiritual perspective, and stop looking at it from a weak, limited, natural perspective. We are the children of God. We are the people of God. And we serve God, and God serves us. You know, God gave us our senses. He gave us sight and smell and feel and taste. You know, He gave us all of those. And our bodies, our physical bodies, were tuned to uh, receive what those senses tell us and to live by them in the natural so 
you know, if I stub my toe, it hurts. You know, my whole body feels it. You know, my senses saw my toe being, well, sometimes it, it doesn't, but um, saw the furniture in the any, anyways uh, that stub my toe. But God so many times in his word talks about not living carnally uh, by the flesh. And that, that means, uh, Dave could teach it better, but... To, to be carnal or in the flesh is to live by those senses. And that's in and of itself not wrong. But God always says, but we are to live spiritually. Because our senses can say, that person hurt me. You know, I, I felt, you know, someone hit me. And so our, 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 our you know, the anger or the, the fear rises up in us and we, and we live by those natural feelings that are natural, but we are so governed by those senses. And that's the part that, that, uh, Dave and Andrew are, are trying to say that we can't be governed by that. Uh, carnal can also mean uh, a sin too, uh, but you just tie that into flesh. And I don't want to go off on another rabbit trail because uh, I want to keep to Andrew's point um, about thinking God's perspective. You know, I was raised in a home where God's word was taught and I was encouraged to read the Bible for myself. So I grew up knowing all the Bible stories and um, I've met people who don't even know uh, a Bible story, one from the other, never heard of David and Goliath or Esther or, or Gideon or anybody. And I, I feel bad for them because all of these uh, patriarchs, so to speak, basically teach us about living carnally or living by God's perspective and I can think of two right offhand you know God uh, God Dave shared David and Goliath where David had God's perspective but Gideon in the natural he even told God I am the least of my brethren he was hiding from the enemy all he saw himself was he was a weakling in the natural and he was not a leader and he was he was gonna just hide in life and until his death. That was basically his perspective. But God came to him and spoke to him, and he gained God's perspective, and he turned the tables on the enemy, and God showed him who was mighty. Um, Elijah or Elisha, I always get the two mixed up, but one of them, uh, there was an enemy coming after him and his servant was seeing these these uh, a vast number of, of of the army coming against him, and he he was in fear. And Elijah or Elisha said, "But the army that's with us, God's army, is greater." And uh, his uh, it God revealed, you know, the heavenly army that was protecting um, them. But I I wanted to actually bring up Esther because Mordecai, her cousin or uncle, uh, I've always um, been confused of which, but I think it was Mordecai's uncle's... Anyways, Mordecai raised Esther. Her name actually was Hadessa. Mordecai was a Jew who trusted in the Lord and Esther ended up being chosen as the, the king's new wife. And there was an enemy, of course, who was going after the Jews. But Mordecai had God's perspective. Even under the influence of the evil king and the, or the, this evil person, he knew that God had put Esther placed her in a high position for such a time as this. And he encouraged Esther to see everything from God's perspective. And as a result, the Israelites were saved. The Jews were saved from utter uh, destruction because of, of this evil man. And all through the Bible, people 
are transformed from whatever they see in the natural, whatever is against them, into God's perspective, into faith as Andrew was bringing out, faith in God and faith in, in who he is and what he's done. And we do have an answer for, for anything and everything that people go through. And that answer is Jesus. All right. Um, cool. That's very good. Very good. Um, I know there's more stories. I know I always go back to David and Goliath, but uh, I know there's many other examples. We're almost out of time here. Uh, I want to see if we can squeeze in one more little section here. Um, insanity. Let's see if we can read about that. Insanity. At each of our Gospel Truth Seminars, I tell people about our Bible colleges. During my remarks, I often ask, how many of you realize that there's more? How many of you desire more and want change in your life? It's not unusual to see 80 to 90 percent of the crowd respond. Most of these are Christians, spirit-filled believers who recognize that there needs to be change in their lives. They aren't satisfied with where they are and they want something more. After all these people admit, yes, I want change, I come back and ask, what are you going to do to affect change? What is going to be any different? One of the definitions of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. If you want something to change on the outside, then you're going to have to start by changing something on the inside. You cannot keep the same internal thought processes and believe that your external circumstances will change. That, by definition, is insane. First of all, you must change in your heart. Then you'll have to take some steps to cooperate with that change. Change isn't going to come from the outside. It begins on the inside. If you want change in your life, then you're going to have to do something differently in your spirit. The moment I bring this up, the moment I bring this, I bring up this truth, I instantly meet resistance because people are afraid to change. I've actually met people before who were in terrible, miserable situations, yet they had adjusted to them. They knew they could survive. It may not have been what they wanted, their dreams or goal, but they have been in their situation a long time. They know that they could survive and they are were afraid of failure, failure should they try to change the reality. If that's you, one of the things that must happen in order to affect change in your life is you're going to have to get to a place where you are sick and tired of being sick and tired. You have to really reach a place where you say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to see these changes externally happen in my life. I'm going to start changing the way I think. I'm going to start taking some risks. Unless you're willing to do these things, you'll never see this external change. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sherry. Uh, this is good, you know. Again, one of the definitions of insanity is doing the same thing and expect a different result. And I've been at many of these conferences where Andrew will ask the question, how many of you can want, to, want, want some change in your life? Whether it be a circumstance, your body, your situation, or just all the above, you know. Uh, and about 80, 90 percent, if not almost the entire auditorium, will raise their hands. But then one of the questions, and then, 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 then uh, you know, people are enjoying the conference and they'll even ask the question, how many of you would like to do this all, have this type of conference every day of the week? <laughs> yeah, all the time. And again, most of them will raise their hand. And then he will ask them, how many of you would be willing to go to Bible college to have this type of teaching every day of the week? And very few hands go up in comparison to the other questions. And now we're not just so much advocating Bible college, but we're talking about the knowledge of God. I think, and I agree with Andrew, everyone should go to Bible college. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. You might have a different vocation and whatnot, but you need to be grounded and discipled in God's Word. You can use this, you can use God's Word, and you can be a disciple in any vocation out there. I think anyone should go to Bible college before they go to other schools. During uh, Andrew's third year, they do have other tracks for the third year, but everyone has to go to the first two years. And uh, we have some, we have our own Bible uh, classes. They're free on our website. They're free. 
And we, we've 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 asked people like Lawson Purdue and Dwayne Sheriff and different people uh, 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 if they were to to to, to pastor disciple in the church, where would be some of their <coughs> primary teachings? And and we 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 use some of those. We have a, uh, and they're free, and they're not. We're not asking a dime for it, you know. And because it's not about the money for me. Yes, we appreciate when people give, so we can continue to do the things we do. Paul did that, and, and that's all biblical, and I'm not, that's not my topic right now. But my heart as a pastor is to get you equipped in God's Word. And, uh, it, you know, if the seed of God's Word is going to change your life, then I want to get the seed in you. <laughs> I'm not going to change your life. He will change your life. God's going to change your life, not me. I want to introduce you to Him. I want to set the atmosphere. I want to set the table for you. You, I, I'm not going to feed you, but I can set the table for you. Does that make sense? I mean, in one sense, I'll feed you by by, by preaching, teaching. Because you know, I have some classes too and some teachings too. But at the same point in time, uh, you know, I'm not going to spoon feed it to you. It's, it's, you're going to have to pick up the fork and and put it in your mouth. You're going to have to 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 put some effort. And then these are just one aspect. It doesn't have to be here. There can be some other Bible classes and different things. But here's my question. And I'm not just so much advertising our Bible classes or Karen's Bible College, even though I support both. If you want change in your life, if you don't like the, the crop that you're harvesting, then what are you going to change about that? Because somewhere, somewhere you're going to need to change your crop. Somewhere you're going to need to change your garden. Somewhere you're going to need to change things. If you sow to the flesh of the flesh, you'll reap corruption, it says Gilly. But if you sow to the spirit of the spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. You know, what if you're ti- sick and tired of being sick and tired? What are you going to do to change that? And there's certain th- things that God's told us to do. God's going to do the work, but you got to change the atmosphere. You know, when you plant a seed, the seed does all the work. <laughs> You might we you might have to water, you might have to harvest, you might have to do some weed and keep weed and feed. But really, if the I don't, it's the seed that's germinating in that soil. It's like a, a woman who's with child. I you know you can take the sonogram, I think they call it, or whatever they call. Uh, you know when they they see the picture of the baby inside and whatnot. But uh, you know. They, you know, you can see all the different aspects of of of, uh, of the nine months of pregnancy, the, the different trimesters and all. But you know, it, it, it's a miracle. And actually, I have a teaching on this. The miracle, you know, when a, a baby is born, the miracle didn't take place on that birth, on that date of the birth of the child. The miracle has been taking place all nine months. The miracle has been taking place. The miracle wasn't taking place when the, the, the apple shows up on the apple, tr- apple tree and you can finally pluck it and eat it. The miracle has been taking place the whole time that seed been sown in the ground has been watering and, and gesting and germinating. The, you're seeing the harvest of that miracle. God's word is a miracle, but you, it's not going to produce in your life. You know, even, uh, you know, we're all against, uh, uh, abortion, uh, but abortion is is having that baby prematurely in a sense. And some of us, we need to get God's word in us, and we need some of us need, don't need to. Some of us have been aborting God's word too early. We need to let it sow and germinate and gestate and come to fruition, so it can produce the harvest that it wants to in our lives. I hope I'm making sense. My, 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 my thing was, we need to have a diet of God's Word. We need to have a lifestyle of God's Word. And Anyway, go ahead. And I just wanted to piggyback on that because Dave's made a very, I would say, valid point. It's more than that. It is the most important point. Uh, you know, Andrew shared the verse about the, the, the peace and the... Um, Okay, I just lost it. But the, it, it basically, getting the knowledge of God in you and why Andrew and Dave and I do advocate for going to Bible college is to get God's Word in you. You know, um, when our, our first year of Karis Bible College, Andrew said there's only two pieces of homework that I have for you this year. One is, I, I want you to learn how to serve. So he had all the students have service hours where you served in a local church or ministry. 
Uh, part of that was there's some people who just they don't know how to serve and part of that was not just to help the local church but to teach people that we are servant leaders. Uh, the, the other homework which was the main homework was Andrew wanted us to read the Bible through in a year and his point wasn't to read it in a year his point was to read God's Word get that seed in you every day of the year and get just start gardening your heart by planting God's Word and it reminded me of I, I want to say this was around 2006 ish um, but we we lived in a in a, uh, a a rental house where the landlord um, and we we talked with the landlord about the the front yard about the front landscaping and they gave us permission if you redo the landscaping and plant plants and flowers uh, just give us the receipts we'll pay you back so Dave and I um, that was just one of the the most fun things we did that year was we landscaped the yard uh, especially the flower bed ourselves and part of that process um, was hard work and I can say that because I didn't have to do it it's mainly Dave Dave had to to get in that soil and dig deep and get some major roots out of the way I mean there were some holes that he had to dig where he was practically waist high in the dirt getting these major roots out of the way so that we could actually plant the plants and um, make the soil uh, uh, soft and nutritious for the plants and um, he just dug and, and some of them were so big he had to use the saw on and that was such a, a major project but in the end when we, it was all done and we had roses and and um, all sorts of stuff of pansies in the front and some other other things I think we had honeysuckle too and uh, so I don't know all we had and um, that to me is a picture of what we need to do to garden our hearts some of the soil is easy to plant and it's great but some of the soil we have to really guard in our hearts because we have gotten hard by being bitter or offensive, like I uh, offended, like I talked about earlier, or whatever it is, hurts and different things in our lives that we've just um, allowed weeds to take over, or or rocks in our garden, in our heart, uh, or the soil to become hard, and. You know, there there is a process to get that garden started and get that soil ready to plant in. And so part of, you know, Andrew's and our thing about going to Bible college is to help get that soil ready for God's Word to be planted so God's Word, so we can abide in, in God and God in us and have and bear fruit. You know, Andrew has a teaching about the called the hardness of heart. And a lot of times we think when someone has a hard heart, they are in some sin. Now, that can be the case. But when Jesus talks about the hardness of heart, and he's teaching his disciples, because Jesus said his disciples had a hard heart. The context wasn't about them sinning. The context was about them not believing God for miracles. It was, uh, I think it's in the book of Mark. I don't have the reference right now. But Jesus is, in a sense, rebuking the disciples with a, about having a hard heart. And it wasn't because they were in some big sin, addiction or whatever. They had a hardness of heart regarding God doing miracles in their life and through their life. You know, your heart can be so hard that you don't believe God. Now, I'm not saying you, you revolted and turned your back on God and you don't believe in God, but I'm just saying you, you just, uh, some, some of our unbelief, some of the reasons we're not seeing breakthrough is because of hardness of heart. That soil has become so hard that we trust that the evidence that can go wrong will go wrong more than we trust the Word of God to change our circumstance. That's a hard heart. You know, this this this, this uh, uh, garden that Sherry was talking about. We had a there was a mulberry bush in there uh, before we got there, and I mean there was just roots. I mean there was roots as big as my thigh, 
I mean, I, before we even started, why did why did I dig all this out? I couldn't even the shovel wouldn't even break dirt. I tried to put a shovel, and I it was going it was just bouncing right off that dirt. There was so many roots. Uh, there was you couldn't plant nothing in that thing, and uh, and we just had to get. And I wasn't trying to get out everything, but I was trying to get it out enough so we could actually plant something. And uh, sometimes, sometimes we, we sometimes we just got to get the old roots out. Some of us have so much religion in us, we got to get some of that religion out so we can see God produce something beautiful in our lives. And uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, Jeremiah chapter one talks about there's, and even Ecclesiastes, like there's a time to plant and there's a time to uproot. And some things need to just be unrooted. And yeah, you know. Um, there's, a th- there's a saying I used to say, I can't change what I've done, but I can change what I'm going to do. I might have made a mess of my life. I might have been, I might be in the place I'm at today because I was too complacent. I don't know how I got here. It, it, it might be my fault or everyone else's fault or a combination thereof, but I can change what's going to happen. I'm going to change, I can change the story. I can change the outcome. Because I gotta get my mind occupied on God. I gotta get into God's Word. I gotta allow faith to be my most dominant thought because of God's Word. And I'm gonna allow God to change my heart and soften my heart and get into the knowledge of God. So I'm gonna believe God. We're gonna change this thing. We're gonna turn this thing around. And we're gonna believe God. And the introduction that we read last week, Andrew started getting some of his revelation, uh, that what he's teaching us now. He went to his staff. He said, I don't know if this is gonna change overnight or if it's gonna take six years or five years or however long this is gonna take. But we're gonna change the way we're thinking. We're going to change the way we're talking, and we're going to believe God, and we're going to see different results. We need to change, you know, um, and there's so much I can pick you back on. There's so many thoughts coming to my mind right now. Where do we start? We're, we're out of time for the day. Get God's Word. Be in good teachings. Be moldable like clay so God can take, change the way you're thinking. Uh, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, if, you know, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not happy with the crop, Something needs to change. And there's maybe you might need to just, uh, in one sense, plow that field so God can plant some new good seeds in there and water with the Word. You know, when we went to Bible college back in 2009, both of us went back, it was just a matter of time where not only did we see change in our lives, but we saw, there was family members and there were other people in our lives, they, they were seeing change. They were seeing change because we had a whole. We we were going to Bible school four days a week, four hours a day, sixteen hours a week. We were working full time. We were working like a dog. But at the same point in time, we were in the Word of God. We were in good fellowship. We were getting good teaching. We were in the Word of God, and you can't be in the Word of God and that type of fellowship for sixteen hours a day and then not change your life. You you start having that kind of diet, you're gonna see some change. You're going to change the way you think. You're going to change the way you act. You're going to change the way you believe. It will change your life. You cannot be in this Word and and the knowledge of God and and be a disciple of God's Word like you're supposed to be and it not change your life. That's the direction we're going with this Bible study. That's why it's called effortless change. There's an effort to get into the Word of God, but God's Word will effortlessly change you. Uh, You you plant the seed, you you garden that garden, but that seed effortlessly grows on its own. You have to harvest, you have to garden that, but the seed does all the work. Does that make sense? Uh, I hope it makes sense. And, you know, this is something, um, gosh, I learned years ago at at actually a women's Bible study we were encouraging each other to get into God's word, each of us for ourselves. And uh, th- there were some in the group who were like, it's just so hard. I just, I, I just don't have a desire to. So the group started praying for each other that we would each have a desire for God's word. And we prayed that and we prayed that. And sooner or later, each of the ladies in that group, including me, just started falling in love with God's Word and wanting to get in God's Word for ourselves. So I encourage you, if you're just struggling with that, you know, God's Word will change your life. And it's a good thing. I mean, God does not hold back on anything from us, but we do need to get that Word in us. Uh, like Andrew's uh, wanting and, and Dave and I are wanting, it will change your life for the good. 
Well, we're out of time for today, and then we'll, we'll be back on uh, Wednesday night. We're, we're back, wrapping up our book on uh, the, the New You and the Holy Spirit. I think we still have probably two more weeks on this book on Wednesday night, and then we're going to have a new book there. And then, So we'll be back on uh, 7 o'clock on, on Wednesday night, and then Sunday morning at 11.15 as we continue our teaching on knowing the Holy Spirit. So anyway, I'm going to pray us out, and Lord, we just worship you. Lord, teach us all, including myself. Uh, to be a student of your word and to prioritize being in your word, having a relationship with you. Lord, that you, your seed, your nature can change us from the inside out. Lord, I, I don't know how much I'm we're communicating, but Lord, I pray that you, you teach us, Holy Spirit, to understand what you're wanting to teach us. We worship you, we magnify you, we glorify you. Bless us as we go. We bless this country. We bless this, uh, no, we bless everyone that's listening. Those who need physical healing, we speak life over their bodies. Those who need a provision, we speak provision over their, their lives. Those who need wisdom, direction, our Lord, I thank you that you would lead them as you led the Israel by a pearl cloud by day and a fire cloud by night. You lead us by your spirit. That we walk in the Spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Teach us to walk with you. Teach us to uh, prioritize being in your word. That our hearts would not be hard, but our hearts would be soft and tender toward the things of God. We worship you, we magnify you. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks for everything. For every good and perfect gift comes from you. We worship you, we thank you that you are our God and we are your people. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you Wednesday at 7 o'clock.